research that we did looking into mostly housing uh, uh, neighborhood developments in, uh, in, in Holland, Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. And out of, these, out of this research um, that we did for another developer, we actually developed these, these core principles that, uh, that were meant to be uh, used as a kind of positive checklist for, for uh, new developments. So I thought about going through those and uh, using some different images from Copenhagen that can hopefully inspire the, the, the group here for discussion. And I'm not going to talk about the, the general sort of Gale methodology today, about counting and public life surveys and all of that. We'll have to, uh, I'll have to come back and talk about that some other day. <laughs> so I'll spare you for that. But of course, coming out of the, the Gale tradition, I have to start by saying that uh, to us, attractive places is not about the built form itself, or it's not about the natural conditions of the place it, uh, only. But it really is connected to the life that takes place between the buildings. We visit places and cities around the world that we love because of its bars and its life and its character. Uh, so that's really uh, what I think we need to focus on when talking about developing attractive uh, places and neighborhoods. And uh, as Jan has been writing about in his books and what we are sort of looking uh, to <laughs> develop further in our, in our work is really uh, people are attracted to other people. So how can we have more of those unique places? And, uh, and Jan, I love the saying of, of Jan's that uh, a good city is like a good party. Uh, people stay longer than they originally planned. And it's a little bit like uh, having a party where everybody will go to the kitchen because it really is the densest and the smallest place, but it's where, where, where you can get, mix your own drinks and all of that, and everybody starts uh, you know, connecting out there, and the rest of the house feels a little bit empty. But you know, those are the types of places that you want to create in, in the neighborhoods and the cities where people can really come together and connect. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about these more softer values, perhaps, that, uh, that San Francisco can maybe be inspired from, uh, which is maybe also a very sort of Nordic approach to community design. And, uh, and I realize that maybe not all of these principles will be directly transferable to the San Francisco context, but then you'll just have to listen and let it pass. Um, but uh, first of all, um, attractive places has to do with how we perceive scale. And these two are images at a city scale and at a neighborhood scale as a, uh, of one of the traditional working class neighborhoods that were built uh, in 1910 uh, for, um, for rural workers actually in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. And you see from above, at a city scale and even at a neighborhood scale, this looks terribly boring. Uh, and if I, if you know, if I have ever had a student like this in urban design come and show me this scheme, I would say, this looks terrible. This is like, you know, this is really, really terrible. But the interesting thing is that once you come down into the buildings and into the streets. Um, it really has a human scale to it, and they're narrow. Uh, they're narrow enough to cars being driving really slow. So kids are playing outside. You have these front gardens where people can come up and uh, spend a lot of time. You have these opening at the ground floors, uh, so that you can have this this, this really nice uh, neighborhood life in the middle of the city. Uh, so, so of course that human scale is really where everything comes to life. So we can have a pretty boring scale, uh, um, scheme from seeing from above, as long as we care for that sort of detailing um, and, and, and life between the between the, the buildings and at at high level. So we have developed sort of eight principles out of this piece of research uh, that I will go through uh, uh, one by one. The first one is making sure that there is a strong identity uh, of place in, uh, in the area. Uh, and that, of course, do have to do uh, with celebrating these existing amenities. So San Francisco is a, water, is a waterfront city, and so is Copenhagen and, and uh, Malmo that uh, Michael came to visit us in, uh, last year to see. 
So the more we can actually uh, create places where we can experience this fantastic natural beauty of the, of the city, the better. Both the hills where we have great views, but also places where we can get really close to, uh, to, to the water. That's super important. Uh, relating to this uh, identity principle is also that we can identify key concepts to the area. And that might be, as we can see over there, the first sort of Boa One housing district, which is very distinct with taller buildings towards the outside and, and lower buildings towards the inner, inner part, where you have like really nice microclimate uh, in, in the middle of that development. Or the way that we design individual places in the city, like this is a, a, a station, one of the biggest stations that we have in Copenhagen, uh, that is very easy to identify with these platform type roofs that are covering uh, bicycle parking and the rest of it. Um, so I think you can work with these types of uh, key concepts at various levels of scale. Creating destinations of exceptional quality is of course super important that you have places within the community where you can really go and gather um, your toes into the water here as, uh, as a family with kids, for example. Uh, and then also making elements of, that are recognizable in a place is also uh, something that builds identity. This example is, uh, is from the circular bridge that has been designed by Ulla Fordhessen, the Icelandic uh, uh, artist that some of you may know. Um, and this just opened half a year ago in, in Copenhagen. But, but little pieces like this, this uh, brings an identity to a place, um, similar to like uh, this, uh, this landscape uh, linear path that was designed by another landscape architect. But has really put a connection to a low, low income neighborhood um, on the map in Copenhagen and, and made that new connection to, uh, to the area. So it can be simple things like that, but making sure that they are on these types of, uh, of elements. And then stimulating, making sure that there is uh, that you can actually stimulate this personal expression opportunity in, uh, in, in areas. This image again is from Go One Housing uh, Housing Exhibition uh, District in uh, Malmo, where you can see that there is a lot of individual houses with uh, individual expressions, but also these uh, different ways that you can design your backup house uh, space uh, or that communal courtyard type area in, in various ways, or even having places where kids can can, can paint or draw or, or other other types of uh, expression. The second uh, principle has to do with uh, creating social community uh, within a neighborhood and encouraging uh, the interaction between people. The first one being uh, very simply trying to establish this balance mix of lifestyles uh, in an area so that you have different, different kinds of people living in uh, an area and encouraging to, to use the, the outdoor spaces. Of, of spaces. That's something we've worked a lot with uh, on the India Basin project, for example. They both have private uh, spaces, like the people sitting on their balcony or on the rooftop of that uh, that building where they pulled out of the window, uh, to the, the semi-private spaces, the, the, the courtyard type uh, up here, where where more more uh, people are sharing that same space, to the to the, the local public uh, space, which is maybe the, the, the lower courtyard picture there, which is in the middle of that housing development where people can come out and, again, the children can play or people can draw out their chairs and sit in between the buildings, to the truly public space where people might come for different events or activities and, and so forth. So we need to make sure that there is all these different types of spaces available in order to support that community, uh, community life in the community. And then creating functional density is also very important. Having many entrances and buildings that all hit the ground with, uh, with many entrances is something that helps activate that, uh, that ground floor. And, uh, and, and also the, the mix of uses in an area. This is one of the central squares in Copenhagen, uh, where you would have um, 
you will have social, um, sort of commercial activities at, at the ground floor, and then further up you would have uh, offices in some of those old uh, buildings, and then further up again you would have residential use. So a, a sort of a truly mix of, uh, of functions within the buildings. Something that I think is really difficult to achieve when you build new buildings. They seem to be either residential or office, um, uh, and, and very, uh, very, very seldom mixed. <clears throat> Again, when we look at this, uh, we need to have um, also uh, active soft edges um, and different levels of privacy. In the diagram here, you can see that uh, uh, something which is really good is when you have balconies overlooking or even front gardens. And we, we've done some studies that show that if you had a front garden, for example, on these types of balconies, um, two thirds of the outdoor activity will take place in those areas. It's, it's so it's, it's really super important. People choose to be those places where they can uh, actively connect with other people in the neighborhood, over and above choosing to be in a completely private uh, area. So, for example, if people have um, a private backyard to choose from and a, a, and a more semi-private area at the front. They choose to, to go to the city private area in front where they can actually communicate with others. Um, and again, just a, a really nice Copenhagen image here of a, of a pedestrian priority street where you have these uh, activated ground floors with lots of different uses. The cars are allowed to drive through this area, but very slow. Uh, it's definitely on the pedestrian's uh, uh, it's, it's pedestrian. Street, but but the cars can drive through uh, sort of five, ten, ten kilometers per hour. These things are important because we need to support that people actually get to know each other. And we know from studies uh, again that in the taller building, this this is another new development that has been built in Copenhagen. Uh, we know that it's more difficult for people to get to know each other up in the taller building compared to the block type typology where they are maybe sharing a courtyard <coughs> down to the very low uh, developments where where everybody knows each other and everybody knows uh, who, who owns every single one of these, uh, these developments. Um, so of course we need to, there was a lot of work in this development to protect this uh, old, uh, it's probably 100 years old, this boat, boat club here, uh, where people have these little uh, the uh, um, houses that they that they had built and, uh, and the first first uh, the developer wanted to clear it all uh, and this the community there they I, were fighting very hard uh, this this new development to, to stay there and in the end uh, they got to stay and it's actually created so much an identity to the place uh, and uh, and you have a more traditional street to the back of it. Uh, in the image, it looks like it looks like it, it's attached to each other. It isn't. Uh, there is a street in between the new buildings and then this little community <coughs> out towards the border. So the, these these new and old things can really uh, uh, create a fantastic uh, mix of identities. I think. And then, of course, it's uh, it's important that we think about reasons to meet, and that can be everything from making sure that there is a corner store. Uh, in the development uh, to, uh, to actually having uh, safe places for something like children's flea market or other types of activities that can bring uh, people together. The third principle is about diversity and flexibility, which is uh, something that uh, is also uh, sometimes difficult to achieve in new developments. Um, but it's, of course, super important in a successful neighborhood to have diverse house typologies, to offer different, uh, different costs and sizes, uh, ownership, new and old developments in between each other if it's possible. Uh, here it's exemplified by the old part of, uh, of Copenhagen, um, but also mixing in with new developments that can be added to this is a, a new development in Germany. Um, Again, the, the flexibility of the ground floor use is, is where it is often possible to have uh, flexibility also in new developments. In the Bo One housing area in, uh, in Malmo, for example, um, it's 
begin with, there wasn't enough density of people to have commercial activities in the ground floor. So some of that was rented out temporarily for residential use. And then as the community grew and more and more people came to the area, it was possible to, to convert some of those newly built uh, uh, areas to, to more commercial activities and kiosks and, uh, and restaurants and cafes and so forth. So that type of thinking about how the area can evolve uh, all the time and also how to how we can provide activities ground floor all day um, and year round is important. This principle about making adjustable and extendable buildings is maybe rather difficult. Uh, you could maybe think about uh, how to achieve that in more courtyard type uh, typologies, but we have found in our research and in our dialogue with the people living in these areas that it actually means a lot to people when they can build something or do something uh, with, the, with the area that they're living in. Uh, so having, having places like this where you can maybe do gardening or do other types of activities is, uh, is very important to people. Um, Designing intelligent storage and parking is another principle. The big, uh, the big block building up there uh, to the upper right is actually a parking garage that has been uh, uh, designed so that on the outside of the parking garage there are single aspect, uh, or what do you call it, doom doom, a single aspect uh, uh, small apartments on the outside. Uh, so the parking garage is kind of uh, uh, tugged in uh, between these, uh, these new types of uh, activities, which is, is one way to actually integrate into the, the development of these little laneways, which are so similar or so so normal, I think, in a U.S. context, to have the laneway uh, uh, to deal with them, some of those storage and packing elements. And then planning for temporary use uh, and, uh, and flexibility also for future developments. Uh, this is a, a map of the whole Malmo Harbor area where the, the city was actually so clever that they started with the Bow One housing area towards the, the west of the development and then they, they saved the northern part where you have the red circle to the very last. And then they made a competition that all the, the developer that, that actually delivered the most quality development, they got to pay for that area. And in a lot of other places, the city would start with that area to, to kick to kickstart development, right? But then they kind of lose out on the big uh, on, on the nice spot right from the beginning. So thinking about how you build up your market, how you how you develop an area over time is is really important, um, so that you can steer that quality and, and, and make sure that you that you do that. But then of course also the Temporary activities is something that we're doing a lot of those types of projects in, uh, in our office. Um, activating, having early activation of a place, creating that identity from the beginning is also important. The fourth principle is really about uh, having that variety of activities in, a, in an area. Um, and first and foremost, we have to cater for the day-to-day -day activities. These are some images from, uh, from Copenhagen again. How to get around in the city on a day-to-day -day basis without actually having to use a car uh, is, is really important. So how, how you get around on foot and a bicycle, um, the day-to-day -day sort of play activities for, 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 for kids, uh, again, families are important. Places where you can comfortably and safely walk your dog and all of these activities that we that we want to do to have a comfortable uh, life, to make sure that that, uh, that can actually take place. Uh, encouraging also commercial and cultural activities between the buildings is also supporting life and, and livability. This is a kind of a small bus, um, the book bus it's called, uh, where uh, the library will actually take books to the local communities and you can come and have folding chairs that they can take out and so forth, uh, or different uh, different kinds of again corner stores or activities that can uh, that can make people meet. Also, creating act, uh, invitations for more exercise and play. Uh, Copenhagen has really developed so many playgrounds around the entire city through the last 15 years, 
And it's interesting that now the playgrounds that the city is developing is for grown-ups. Uh, because it's a way of, act, uh, of keeping the population healthy. Um, and uh, this, this one is actually funny. It's very close to the harbor front. Like, literally, the harbor front starts where this, where this image stops. Um, and, uh, and so there's something about safety and regulations and stuff like that. Uh, this would probably never happen in the States uh, because uh, jumping in a trampoline like two meters away from the harbor front would probably not happen in the US. But, um, but it's, it's so funny to see like Japanese tourists or grown-ups or everybody jumping around on these uh, trampolines in the sidewalk. Uh, I, saw, I saw one uh, Japanese tourist who was like trying to jump from, you know, from one hundred and like he, in the end, he actually fell over because he got so much speed on. <laughs> uh, these types of playful uh, elements have been totally integrated into the whole, uh, whole of, of, uh, of, of Copenhagen now. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's a strategy to, to be uh, researching itself. Planning activities for all seasons, I think that is important. Uh, Copenhagen is definitely a four-season city, uh, and San Francisco is too, uh, even though you have uh, slightly milder uh, <laughs> than, than we have. Uh, these are just a couple of winter images from Copenhagen, because we, us we usually forget about how to also plan for activities in the colder uh, parts of the year. So what can you actually do in incubation, uh, for example, in the future, when the wind is blowing and it's super cold? Like, what kinds of activities could you, could you, could you plan for? Uh, in this case, it's the, it's the central lakes I'm living uh, right, next to, right next to the of Copenhagen. And when they do freeze occasionally at winter, it's fantastic to be able to walk out into the, the space that you can normally never walk into. And, and, and people will be skating or, or doing uh, and other kinds of activities, which is amazing. And then, of course, creating invitations to just relax and enjoy uh, is, is really important. Like, uh, public life is not only about noise and activities and events and, and, and all that all the time, but it's also about just having places where you can relax not have all that noise and bus from the from, from the city and just uh, enjoy the view or or, or the sun. We there's actually research made into this uh, in Scandinavia research that is showing that if people uh, live close to uh, a park, just a, just the notion that they can go to the park, not they don't necessarily have to use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but just the fact that they know about it uh, is actually reducing their stress level. So it's pretty significant. Connectivity. I can't talk about livability without mentioning connectivity, of course. Coming from Copenhagen, uh, bicycle means so much to the city. Like 36% of the population in the greater Copenhagen, which is 1.5 million people, are bicycling on an everyday basis. 55% of the population living in the city center is bicycling every day, more than half. So this is like a, a, a this is like a, a normal everyday image from from Copenhagen. Uh, mobility, and it really changes the feeling and the vibe of the city, that people are out and about and you can see people's faces, they're not inside of cars. Um, We're sold. Going <laughs> <laughs> in the summer, it's yeah. so amazing. <laughs> no, but it really does. It, it, the, the whole city becomes much more of a people city. And, uh, and then, of course, you can take the bicycle with you on the local trains or on the metro. Uh, and you can buy one ticket and it will take you through the whole region. You don't have to pay for the bike, you just bring it along. Uh, so it's, it's like super well connected and uh, easy to get around. Um, creating a hierarchy of networks and, and, and easy orientation in, in relation to connectivity is of course very important. Uh, again, when we look at the bicycle route and network, we have a system where 
the bicycle tracks or uh, the bicycle lanes are elevated a little bit with a curbstone height. Uh, and when you are crossing uh, the, the big cross sections, the, the bike lanes will be painted blue, so it's very easy to see where you are. And uh, even though we have this massive uh, numbers of people bicycling, the number of casualties have been going down every, every single year for the past uh, 20 some years now. Uh, so it's of course something to do with developing the culture uh, of mobility in a, in a city. Um, the car drivers become much more aware of, of, of people walking and cycling. So it's changing our behavior and our sort of mentality about how to get around. And um, people grow up as cyclists in Copenhagen. You can see that the image of the of the kindergarten out there cycling. Uh, uh, there is also even a playground where the kindergartens can take the kids to the to the playground and teach them in a mini mini version how to do the stop signs, and how to do that. But there is like mini version uh, cross sections with red and, and green light and uh, all bus stops and everything um, so that they can learn how to orient in the city. Uh, and in grade uh, three it is uh, the police, the local police will come to the school and the kids will take a driver's license, bike driver's license in the schoolyard and in the vicinity of the school. And then in, uh, in sixth Great. Uh, there's a, a second test where the, the kids will be driving like a couple of kilometers round in the, in the city districts of their school. And then the, the, the police will be positioned in different corners to see whether they are doing the right hand signals and stopping the right places and, and so forth. Um, uh, simply in order to uh, make sure that the kids continue cycling. Uh, we found out that when once the kids start uh, coming to sort of seventh, ninth grade, they, they stop cycling and they use uh, they use the metro or the bus or, or something more. So, in, so encouraging more cycling uh, is, is built into the school program now uh, with this collaboration with the kids. So it's. Uh, yeah, you really get it into your blood. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the car culture in the US is a bit like that. Designing uh, proximity and walkability is, of course, uh, super important. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing here a super long Copenhagen street uh, in this first image where you can see that the sidewalk is taken across the side street. Yeah? So that means that the cars that are coming out of that side street, they are the ones that have to slow down and look and then slowly drive over that sidewalk and curve into the street, into the middle street. It's not the other way around where the, where the people walking have to wait for the cars to drive out. So it's simply showing a different priority where the, the people walking here are the ones that are prioritized. And then, of course, we have the pedestrian uh, uh, streets that are completely pedestrianized, uh, and we find that in every little city around the Scandinavia, that we have these very narrow streets where there used to be cars here, but they're too narrow uh, for a lot of cars. So, almost in any, in any little town, we find the pedestrian streets uh, today. And that, of course, also encourages uh, accessibility for all kinds of, uh, of user groups uh, through, uh, through uh, society. Creating good digital networks uh, is also to have free internet access in our local trains. So on all trains, you can sit there and you can work. So it becomes kind of an extension of the public space in itself. Uh, and you can carry on working as you know. Sixth one is about enjoyable places, and that has to do with the intimacy of the way that we design again the places. Uh, the more human scale again that we can make those places, uh, the, 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 the better. And these again, I'm very, I'm a big fan of these cold out type private spaces as, as well that we have many places. I think in in, uh, in the U.S. there is a lack of differences in typologies for buildings where only have the the tower or the single family, and there is very little in between. Um, uh, and, and these types of 
courtyard blocks that we have in Copenhagen. The courtyard used to be um, a place for um, for dumping your trash, and uh, they would be parking lots in the old days and so forth. But none of these courtyards have been cleared out and have been greened. And now these are wonderful community community places where uh, 30, 60, uh, 80 families are sharing that space. And the uh, kids are just running down the stairs to play with each other when they come home from school, even though the parents are up in the apartment because it's a closed, enclosed courtyard space where they can be safe uh, and they create these connections with each other. Uh, and, and I think it's it's really easy living. It's, it's, it's easy. And you don't have to worry so much about the safety of your kids and having to buy them for the and know what they do. Microclimate is super important. Um, this is an image of, a, of one of the bridges in Copenhagen, and you can see that people are sort of sitting down on the pavement, just enjoying that sun, and they can do that even though this is a, an early spring day, um, but they're protected by the wall, and they're enjoying that sun coming in. And, uh, and I think in, in San Francisco as well, we need to think about this wind coming in from, uh, from, uh, from the ocean. And we do do that, uh, have to think about that in Copenhagen too. So the less of a height difference you can have uh, uh, in the development, the better, because the more height difference and the further the buildings are, are apart, the more risk there is for the winds to come down in, in between the buildings. So, um, so again, that's uh, something that you should definitely uh, care about if you want to create more of a, a, a protected area. And then stimulating the senses. Um, water is fantastic. Again, San Francisco is a water city. It would be fantastic if you could have more water uh, and use the water, even maybe the surface water or the, or the gray water, if we could, if we could use it in, in, in different ways um, so that we are making the city a little bit more attractive. Um, we found that if there is a distance of 300 meters from a residential area um, to a, 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 a place, it's used 2.7 times more than if the distance like a kilometer. So that means the further, the closer you are, and, and it's better to have many small parks and many small places for people to go to than having a football field uh, a kilometer away. So these small public parks and, and so forth is incredibly important for livability in city. Creating quality of design and materials, of course it's important. Um, uh, again, I'm showing this traditional Copenhagen side wall. This was actually designed in the 1930s, and we are still using this side wall typology, where you have a concrete block, and then you have these, cur these uh, uh, granite, granite sets of granite stones, uh, and it's super easy to repair because the granite stones are set in, in gravel. So if you want to repair something in that uh, pavement, you just take it up, repair whatever you have to do with the infrastructure, and put it back in. You don't have these uh, terrible concrete asphalt type uh, uh, sidewalks that are totally broken all the time. So, so this model has been carried through for almost a hundred years now in Copenhagen, and the entire city is designed like that. So it's 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 really uh, sustainable in that way. It's it, and it, it's uh, it's holding up really really, uh, really good. Um, yeah, designing for these pleasant outdoor spaces uh, I've talked about already, but again, uh, this this uh, type of activity I think is. Uh, it's one of the places where people, people can also uh, very easily connect with each other. Safety, of course, is important for livability. We need to feel safe and secure uh, in the city we live in. And some of the things that uh, is important to safety is, of course, the overlapping of, uh, of functions in time and space, uh, but also uh, the fact that you can overlook the uh, areas like passive surveillance is super important, like the dial there, being able to look down into the space. This is a very sort of traditional uh, J Jacobs principle, right? Uh, that, that we all know about already. Um, 
designing well-built places is, is, is equally important. Uh, then we think about how to orient at night and uh, at evening, and ensuring pedestrian and cycle safety. But there are areas where we really feel that it's, uh, it's safe for you to play and cycle. And then maybe intelligent solutions for also more enclosed spaces. This is a neighborhood in Copenhagen where the parking is underground, and everybody actually has to, to access the apartments. You have to come out into that communal courtyard space before you can then walk into the buildings. And that's a way of activating that uh, central courtyard. Instead of people parking in the basement and then going directly up into their, into their apartments, then the area becomes much more derelict and much more, not as, not as safe actually. Um, and then this, I like this image of uh, uh, the mother, uh, maybe you can't see it so well, but the mother uh, sitting behind the glass uh, being able to talk with the child and the knee. Uh, but the fact that you, I mean, that could have been just wood, uh, like a, a traditional wood fence, but these little details that can make that visual connection uh, uh, happen in a good way is, is great. And then the last principle, I won't tire you so much more, but uh, it's about creating environmental sustainability, of course, as well. Um, uh, that ties into the whole um, transportation issue again, uh, celebrating that as much as possible. These are a couple of, the, of solutions again from, uh, from Scandinavia. Uh, increasing the renewable energy uh, is something that we are super focused on in Scandinavia right now. In Copenhagen we have this very ambitious goal to become the first uh, carbon neutral capital in the world by 2025. Um, so you can see in this graph that we have to increase the inhabitants with about a thousand inhabitants uh, uh, per month over the next 10 years. And while, while doing that, we have to uh, reduce the carbon emissions at the same time. So this is a, a really ambitious goal that, uh, that uh, forces the city to look at behavioral changes, uh, but also to renew and to uh, uh, with wind power and uh, yeah, the, the, the whole the whole package. Um, make uh, eco-sensitive designs. Uh, these are a couple of the solutions. Also, again from Nama, where the water is uh, recycled uh, in in the area, and making sure that we are celebrating that and visualizing it so that people can actually see what's happening. Recycling the, the, the waste and the, the water uh, of, uh, of the new development I think is, is hugely important. And then establishing this ecological diversity where we have a mix of uh, plants and uh, uh, yeah, really making sure that our cities are, uh, are diverse uh, in, in all aspects. So that was kind of the, the, the eight principles uh, that uh, we have been researching. So in summary, what, uh, what San Francisco can learn from Copenhagen, I think, is about focus on the life between buildings, celebrating that, and provide public space with a balanced and integrated community. Uh, this is uh, an image from the new uh, Copenhagen farmer's market that has been built, which is about probably about four years old now, uh, hugely successful uh, new public space. Uh, and to the back of that area, uh, we have a public plaza on top of a parking garage, which is also <coughs> the outdoor space for the school. So manage your collective investments with care, uh, more roads with more traffic, but I think the other, the other is also um, proven by many of our public space and public life research that um, more public spaces also brings more public life uh, in the cities. And I think uh, uh, sort of a, a Nordic notion of citizenship uh, is something that I thought a lot about. Uh, I, I think in, in Copenhagen it is no longer so much about, it, it's no longer a discussion really about right or left. Uh, it's, uh, it kind of, it's, it's about a collective understanding of uh, contributing to uh, a greater whole or something shared in order to gain as an individual. Uh, so if there was anything that I could export to San Francisco, that would be
ask questions in chat. So uh, I 